All right. Good evening, folks, and uh, thank you for coming out this evening and <coughs> attending the Ward 4 and 7 NPA meeting. So <coughs> ordinarily, we have our Facebook live stream going. We're working on that technology glitch right now, but we do have Channel 17 with us this evening, and we thank you for being here. So I'd like to <coughs> start off the evening. We, we are going to go around and do introductions and announcements. And for this section, what we, if you have an announcement, we'd like to try to keep it like to 30 seconds, sort of up front. And then um, if there's something else on your mind, we can talk about that at greater, in greater detail during the community members <coughs> and elected officials forum at the tail end. I will remind us all of our the ground rules is that we try to listen to others who are speaking, respect the agenda and the process, share your opinion politely, and treat one another with respect. And for more information about the 4 and 7 MPA, uh, you can find us <coughs> at, the, uh, on, at the Burlington VT.gov CEDO page under neighborhood services and NPAs if you're looking for more information. So <clears throat> with that, I think we might as well go ahead and get started. And um, uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me. James Loop, Ward 7, NPA member. Chris Trombley, Ward 7, Steering Committee member. member. Ryan Frink, Ward 7, Steering Committee. Jeff Clark, Ward 7, Steering Committee. Alex Farrell, Ward 4, Steering Committee. Matt Hurlbert, Ward 7, Steering Committee. Hi, I'm Jenna O'Donnell. I live in Ward 4. Eric Corbin, Ward 4, Steering Committee. Franny Stegwin, Ward 4. Jackie Schultz, Ward 4. Martha Malpas, Ward 7. Nancy Ellis. Ward 4. Franklin Paulino, Ward 4, and uh, North District City Councilor elect. Zachary York, Ward 4. Steve Hamlin, Ward 7. Molly Mordike, Ward 7. Lindra Mordike, Ward 7. Take him out, Yvonne with Cito. Alicia DeMario, Ward 4. Kearney, Ward 4, Housing Board of Review. Monica Ivancic, Ward 7, uh, School Board Commissioner for Ward 7 as well. Nancy Comstock, Ward 7. Peter Ireland, War. Ward. Dottie Ireland, War. <laughs> Hannah, Very intern with CETA. Erica Bundy Reddick, Ward 4. You. And if you haven't done so already, I'll remind you that we do have an attendance list in the back. So at some point during the evening, if you would please sign in so we can keep track of our excellent attendance numbers. So uh, from the steering committee uh, announcements, we want to remind you that there are still slots on the steering committee for four and seven that are open. and. According to the bylaws, and yes, the NPAs do operate under bylaws, and they uh, provide for steering committee elections in April of each year. So at next month's meeting in, <clears throat> at the end of April, we will be holding uh, steering committee elections. So everybody who's currently serving, I think, is potentially up for re-election, and if you're interested in serving or if you know someone who would be a good contributor to the steering committee, um, let us know and we'll get you volunteered. Next question. Yes. Uh, what if people can't be at the next meeting? What if they can't be at the April meeting or something like that? Okay, got it. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So, on the, on the back side of today's agenda are all the members of the steering committee. 
So if you are interested or in yourself or if you want to nominate someone else, contact one of us and we can certainly handle that nomination at the April meeting. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I believe it's nine, nine members per ward. So war and, wards four and seven technically could have a steering committee of 18 people. And we're currently at about 10, 11. Yep. So there's room to grow. Thank you. Um, any other questions before we get started this evening? OK. Um, I guess we'd like to <coughs> start off with the Community Development Block Grant representatives to Ward 4 and 7 are Alex Farrell and James Liu. So, thank you. Um, all right, so James and I represented uh, this NPA uh, on the CDBG board. Um, me for Ward 4, James for Ward 7. So um, a quick rundown of what this is. Um, HUD distributes funds through the CDBG boards to different states and communities. Um, Burlington is the only municipality in the state that actually gets its own CDBG money from HUD. And the goal is to address the, the root causes of poverty. And um, they, they list certain criteria for it, but um, what our job as advisory board members is, is um, basically we review the applications of everyone that's, um, that's gone through this process uh, working with CEDO to, to apply for CDBG funds for either what's considered a, a development grant or um, what's the, what's the uh, I knew you were going to ask me that. No. So we meet, right. we meet twice. Yeah. So one is more community related and one's more development and housing related. So um, the process is that applicants have, they have to let the city know that they're, they're going to submit a letter, letter of intent, that they're going to be applying, and then they submit their applications um, by January. Um, and so the advisory board comes together, and we have qu quite a few, three, four weeks to review the applications, and we, we rank them, we look at the merits of the program, um, what we thought of the application, um, and then we, uh, we come back together and uh, decide how to distribute the money. And it's a little unique, too, because I think the process for our city um, is much more progressive than some other cities, is that one person from every NPA is represented, so there's eight people from NPAs, and four people that the mayor um, has put on the committee, and then one person from the state. There is a vacancy for youth this year. Um, they struggle to get the youth involved, but um, unfortunately, the volunteers, I think, get a little overwhelmed or sometimes intimidated. It's a lot of work. And, um, and it's a lot for young people, and the meetings are late. Yeah. So um, we're working on that for in the future and working on suggestions on how to get a young person involved on the committee. But it is unique because uh, technically the way, the way it's distributed is um, the mayor has the authority to um, distribute this himself with, I believe, city council approval. Is that right, Chris? And so the fact that the, the NPAs get to send a representative to be part of this body to decide how this is distributed, that's, that's unique and it's actually really special that we get to have this input, um, hear from folks before the process. We can't always share specifics back during it because of for the benefit of the applicants, but <clears throat> it allows all of us to have a little bit of a say in, in how this HUD money is distributed rather than just, you know, top down it goes where it goes. So, um, the meetings are all public, so if anyone cared to go to the CEDO website, you could look to see. I did check, and there is no notes on our meetings. They're not? Okay. So, because I, I was trying to figure out how much we were allowed to share, but they weren't public yet. In the past, has the mayor overridden your recommendation? That's a great question. I asked the same question, <laughs> um, and my, I got the answer was no. Um, and I think even if the mayor did, the mayor did have some priorities, and I think the four representatives he sent in um, shared those recommendations as well as um, somebody from the mayor's staff. Um, 
I don't think that swayed anybody. There's very um, nice um, conversations. They weren't arguments, they were conversations, but they were long conversations and they were very positive. And I really don't think any of those um, mayor's top choices really swayed um, the group. And I, I think city council would um, also hold the mayor accountable to, to his choices, but I think they'll be good. And that, that would be public if some, you, you would see what our recommendations were, and then if there were a change, that would be seen by the public. So. I think one, one that I'll quickly share that I think you'd be most interested in is Lauren Tide. Is that, am I saying it right? That's the CHT project. Um, that's right on North Avenue. So in Cambrian Rise. Yep. So that they asked for a hundred thousand dollars. So that was something that was up for consideration and was one of the mayor's priorities. Um, so that was voted on the last meeting. How big is the pool of money that Hyde gives from the It's just under five hundred thousand. Yeah. Like four eighty three I think was the amount. And the requests are always far in excess of what we're given. So hard decisions. They were just over double, I believe. The community um, was a little bit closer than the development. The development was at least double. Yeah. So it was a little bit harder decisions. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, our, our next agenda topic is uh, <clears throat> on the, uh, <clears throat> at the, uh, in, an NPA resolution to increase the ward budget for MPAs, which is currently $400 a year, to a proposal for $2,500 a year, and that and and that would uh, come out of the, uh, the the city budget. And each, uh, as according to the proposal that Chris will explain the the history there, um, that $2,500 would be allocated to each of the eight NPAs, so. Yeah. <clears throat> so given that Chris is our timekeeper, I'm gonna trust that he's dil <laughs> diligent to his role. There you go, so here you go, Chris. I can be concise. Um, so the reason we stacked this up next to the CDBG is because the NPAs used to be funded from the Community Development Barack Grant. As uh, I see, uh, Karina's here, very familiar with that. Uh, previously, the funding was considerably higher. As over the years, we've noticed that funding has decreased, uh, regulations have increased, and so it's harder to use that money. So we as the MPAs have a budget of $400 for each ward. So with $400, last year we spent our money on fancy things like snacks, um, <laughs> new wireless microphones, so that folks who um, had a hard time hearing could hear better. Um, and we could have wireless remotes, uh, remotes around the room. We bought a wireless mic and mic stand. But what we'd like to do is seek uh, a moderate increase in funding, uh, raising that to 2,500 per ward, um, so that we can increase our mission to further you know, the, the mission of the MPA. So things that could be, maybe it's uh, better speakers, a better sound system here, because the Parks Department hasn't provided that. Maybe it's a crosswalk in the area that everybody wants done, but they want it done first, or the sign that is at the top of 127, that was a MPA funded project. So it's a, it's a pretty meager ask. Um, and so we as the steering committees from each of the MPAs got together and kind of came together with what do we want to put forward to city council. And so on the bottom of your agenda, uh, you'll see a resolution for approval for members four and seven, 2,500 per ward. So because we meet as a, a four and seven, that's $5,000 for our ward, um, to increase the capacity to further the mission of the MPAs to be included in fiscal year 2020 budget. So the city is finalizing that budget now. So we want to get something to the city council uh, as a uniform voice from each ward or district uh, so that we can report something back and say, we met with our MPA, they either support this or they don't, or they have some further feedback, and we'd like to make that recommendation so we can get it in time for 
uh, budget increase for this year. If we don't, it's dealing with, you know, scratchy microphones and uh, speakers for another year. And uh, so we'd like to turn that over for maybe there's some public comment uh, regarding, uh, is it too little, is it too much? Are you okay with it as is? Um, maybe next, maybe baby steps forward? How many of us are there? How many people attend a meeting online or here? You know, uh, I'm glad you asked that, Peter. If you actually look at it proportionally, some of these are better attended than city council meetings proportionally. There's, what, 10,000 uh, residents out in the New North End. This is a pretty good crowd for a, for a March meeting. Uh, we also post that uh, um, through Channel 17 Live online, and we do Facebook Live. So for the folks that can attend, because it's hard, everyone's kind of got a busy life, so we try to make that available for offline viewing as well. So what would you get? So $100 for each of us? Uh, I'm not sure we're looking for a uh, for cash distribution, but but it's not a bad way of looking at a grant. Is it is it worth it, or should we spend our money through the city? Absolutely, that, and that's and that's essentially what we're asking is is this five thousand dollars kind of we as the North District? Uh, do you want that just kind of where it is now, or do you want to have a little more? Um, democracy here where we can advocate for smaller targeted projects that might, might not be high on the list of um, some bigger city projects. Uh, so we can kind of micro-target some improvements in the neighborhood. At one point there was some discussion about upping it to 10 or even more thousand, but City Hall was gonna have, they were kinda gonna own us, I think. They were gonna have some serious input into our meetings. Well, this, this won't happen now? So I think there's been some um, I, a battle of ideas of what does the role of the MPA serve? How do we oversee that? What's the role of CEDO in that? Uh, and so the reason we came to this resolution was, this is kind of a base hit. This isn't the home run that I think everyone's maybe looking for where there's a, a bigger ask. And maybe we can take this as a small advancement towards a bigger increase uh, in, in future years. but. Um, we want to try to maintain the autonomy of the MPAs, where it's really run by community members. We set the agenda, we're asking the city to come, we're setting the topics, it's not the city that's setting those topics, and they're not, um, you know, it's not censorship, and, and you also want to have a sustainable model so that through whoever's in City Hall or whoever's in government, it's a sustainable model for the residents uh, in, in their district. And I think you'll notice that each district or ward is very unique. Two, three, or five uh, is, have very different agendas than we do. Um, so we want to maintain that autonomy so that each this, this $5,000 would just be unique to us instead of a, a, a citywide distribution. Um, so one idea that some of us neighbors had was to perhaps have like a dinner or a, a potluck dinner. Or, so I can't tell you $5,000 per year I mean, that, that would be great, um, but if we could spend part of that money on having more of a social gathering, and I think that would attract more people and people with children to come. Um, they do something similar for the Ward 2-3 NPA, and I think it's really successful. It gets a lot of people there. So it would be it's great if we could do that here in the New North End. So $5,000 a year might be a pretty meager uh, dinner for everybody. Um, one Correct, absolutely, and so that's why, you know, we it, we, we realize sometimes it's, it's easier to ask for maybe small steps uh, to advance that. One unique thing about 2-3 is they do have a community dinner prior to the uh, to the meeting, but it's not funded by the MPA. That's wholly funded. No, they, they do, they get. Partially funded, yeah. wholly funded? Um, at least partial, maybe wholly. And then they do donations at the... They ask, yeah. Yeah, and so... I, I, I've heard a little bit of everything, but that's certainly a model that uh, we would want to discuss as a, as a community if we, if we were awarded this allotment. How do we want to use that? Is it a community dinner? Is it targeted development uh, or an improvement on something in the neighborhood? I think that's for us to decide for ourselves. That works for that neighborhood. Does that work for us? I'm assuming this conversation right now is not about what we want to do with the money. It's just about whether or not we want to ask for the money. That's correct. Is that correct? Okay. So I'll hold my opinions about what to do with the money for now. 
Um, I would just say that the one thing, if you're going to bring this to city council, is you have to prove to them that our district cares. And I mean, I, I get that maybe this is a good turnout, but we have to prove to them that there are enough people in the ward or the district or whatever that actually are going to show up and actually give a crap and are going to do something. And so I guess that's my only two cents right now. That's, that's, that's on the forefront for us as well because, you know, we want to make this worthwhile for the residents. And if that's not where you guys want to go, we'll, you know, that's, that, that's why we're bringing it to the group to share what, what's the... What's the direction that we want to go in as a group? What is the energy currently going to reach out and get At $800 a month, uh, we're doing uh, Facebook engagement, uh, live TV engagement, and that's it. Um, so, front porch forum. That's right. You usually see my name uh, once a month on there. So, that's that's that's. So we're 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 me here. Uh, knowing how government funding works. Yes. As you're seeking to go from several hundred to several thousand, is it a use it or lose it, or are you allowed to have a carryover? So curr currently it's spend it or lose it. Um, and so th I would imagine that's the same scenario. Um, and that's part of the reason why we, we, you know, we're kind of going for a base hit, not the home run, because how do you spend down such a big amount in a reasonable, fiscally responsible, not open to fraud, you know, we're, we're being mindful that this is money put forth by the taxpayers. So. Absolutely. Yes, I, I, I wholly agree. Yep. Uh, my name's Karina Driscoll. I think many of you might know that I ran for mayor last year. Um, and I want to speak up on the resolution. But also, I should say, I just moved back to the new North End. Um, I'm living on Fern Street, and I'm very happy to be back, um, having grown up here and joining three family households out here again. A, a great place to live. Um, and what I also just wanted to say is that one of the major issues at the campaign was public engagement and community engagement. And when we talked about the NPAs, you know, when they were initially formed in the 1980s, they were formed to empower people throughout the city to have a say in what we do with our funds and what we do with our, um, with our government. And frankly, if there's not a lot of power, you don't have a lot of interest. And long ago, you know, the CDBG funds, we were, which we were just talking about, you know, million dollars would be distributed essentially at the recommendation of the NPA. That's a lot of citizen power, and you better believe people were attending. Uh, some amazing programs were started in the city of Burlington in that period of time because a million dollars and a whole lot of everybody's ideas, uh, some really great things happen. So talking about 5,000 for the new North End is a, is a drop in the bucket, but hopefully what it can do is give us the opportunity to do more community engagement, whether we choose to use it for dinners or otherwise, I think it would help increase in t attendance. And I think what I would say is having spoken with a lot of people, I'll just contribute that um, I think the desire is there for that community engagement throughout the city and the desire to participate in the neighborhood planning assemblies and have them be more than, them, more than they are and have them feel that autonomy and listened to. Um, and um, I've only lived here for a couple months again, but I'm very happy to be back and look forward to participating in the NPA and doing whatever I can to help um, encourage turnout as well, because it's up to us. And I think with a little bit of money, we can do, we can do a lot. Okay, so I, I would say that <coughs> um, <coughs> we kind of drifted away from <coughs> focusing on, the, don't, don't go away. I mean, because <coughs> you, you have to moderate the question, oh, yes. okay? Um, we sort of drifted away from focusing on the resolution to already beginning to think about what we would do with that money, which, which we need to formally vote. We need to formally vote, take a position on it, and then um, the steering committee would love to put this on the agenda for at a future meeting where we could actually focus on how those funds might be spent. So um, with that, Chris, I'm going to let you... So, uh, show of hands uh, for those in support of the resolution uh, as typed on the agenda. Uh, you can just raise your hand. Any opposed? I'd like to say it was unanimous. That is fantastic. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Is that the only unanimous thing that we've had in the North District in a while?
Thank you very much, everyone. Take care. So for a little bit of uh, context with this, we're going to have to spend our $400 on a new mic. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so if I could just quickly add a little bit of context at the all wards NPA meeting that <clears throat> several of us occurred, just attended a couple of weeks ago, um, it was interesting to see that uh, currently CEDO uh, tracks our spending of our $400 a year and so far uh, only one of the wards in the city had spent any of that money because uh, nobody bothered to spend any of their $400 because uh, sort of for a lack of imagination of what are we going to do to have impact with $400. So, so <laughs> so, all right, so um, I'd like to move on with our representative <clears throat> from the Parks and Rec Summer Program. Um, Gary Rogers is here, the <clears throat> director of parks. Superintendent. Superintendent, okay. So, <clears throat> um, so I'm going to give you the mic because I'm not sure exactly what it is you want to tell us. So first I'd like to say um, that Cindy White, who's the director, would like to be here tonight. She's at a PAC meeting that is running late. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm the recreation superintendent for the city. My name is Gary Rogers, and um, Cindy asked me to come by tonight to talk a little bit about new summer programming that we ha have going on this summer in the Parks, Recreation, Waterfront Department. So I'm going to start with events, and um, an event that's very dear to many of your hearts, um, the Letty Beach Bites, which happens, woo which happens down at Letty Park. It's going to be expanded this year. Um, because uh, we were doing every other Wednesday uh, and occasionally we had rainouts because this is Vermont in the summertime, we might go two, three weeks without having a beach bites. So the new plan this summer is to start Wednesday, June 19th and go every Wednesday to August 7th. With the exception of July 3rd, <laughs> which falls on a Wednesday. Uh, and the other um, Update on that is that this year we will be providing live music. So that's something that we haven't done in the past. We've had some DJs occasionally, but we'll have bands this year also. So um, it's been a, a real success, and um, we really feel like bringing events to this part of town, which, you know, a lot of times um, when you look at where events are happening in the city, um, we don't get a lot of events out here in the New North End. So we want to bring programming and events to this part of the town and uh, we're very excited to expand that program. So um, another uh, family type event that is uh, being offered this year that's never been offered is we're doing trips, uh, history trips, to uh, three different historic sites, uh, Fort Ticonderoga, Harberton Battlefield, uh, the um, Crown Point. Uh, so uh, that, that's new and they're gonna be family trips and also senior trips. Um, some other new adult programs. Uh, we're offering adult ballet for the first time here at the Miller Center. Uh, we have messed around with adult music programs, learned to play instruments. Some have been hit and missed. We haven't tried that in a couple years. So at the Old North End Community Center at 20 Allen Street, which was formerly St. Joseph School, we're actually offering a series of piano lessons, ukulele lessons, and guitar lessons individual lessons and group lessons. So we're going to um, try that again to try to get people involved with um, learning some music. Uh, we really are ramping up our 50 plus programming. Uh, and this summer we have some great trips. Uh, so there's a History Hunters trip for 50 plus. Uh, we also are doing a vineyard tour. And that's something that we've thought about doing in the past and we haven't. So we've got three different vineyards on the docket to go visit with 50 plus. We make it very reasonably priced, so it's $7 for the transportation. Um, wine tastings are on you, but uh, if you're interested in, uh, in that sort of tour, um, that, those registrations, we try to make it easy for everyone in the city. There's like pickups all around. There'll be a pickup at Heineberg Center, a pickup at um, the Champlain Senior Center, which is located at 20 Allen, and a pickup at our Pine Street office in the South End, so that people from different parts of the, of the city can participate. 
Um, let's see, what's we got? Oh, we also have uh, some nature walks that we've never done before with seniors, so getting seniors outside. Um, when I say seniors, not 50 plus, I'm about six months away, so you know I'm in that category myself. Um, so the nature walks, uh, Robert Frost Trail, Button Bay State Park, and then a trip to the Vermont Institute of uh, Natural Sci uh, Sciences, which is where the Raptor Center is. If any of you have not been to the Raptor Center in Queechee, it's really quite spectacular. They have birds of prey there. Um, incredible eagles, condors, hawks, and owls of all sorts, and they're all um, birds that are mending or can't be released in the wild. It's very uh, educational and it's really a, a very interesting place to visit. Um, if we uh, pivot to kids, uh, we have many, many camps. So we have our, our champ camps that we've been offering, which are licensed child care camps for many years. I'm just going to focus on some new things that we're providing this year. Um, Adventure Ropes course, uh, this is actually the second summer we're doing this, but we partnered with the University of Vermont to offer camps um, at the UVM Ropes course. Um, great, they fill, up, um, they fill up every year, and we do multiple sessions. Um, and just to let you know, I haven't mentioned this yet, but there are scholarships available for youth and for seniors. So if you are a senior or if you have a family with children and you're looking for help, please contact the Parks, Recreation, and Waterfront Department. Um, we actually are um, on the verge of making a big announcement about some scholarship money that we were receiving um, from a donor um, in the city that's coming next week. And it's a really sizable um, donation to our scholarship fund that we're very much excited about. Um, we, we tell people we, won't, we don't want to turn anyone away when it comes to youth programming. So um, please set, get that word out for us that if you are a family or know a family who might need a little financial assistance, contact the Parks and Recreation Waterfront Department and we'll make it work for you. So um, ropes course, um, we're offering two disc golf camps. I know disc golf has sometimes been controversial here in this end of town, but it is one of the fastest growing sports in America. Uh, and so we are offering a beginner disc golf uh, camp and we're also offering a traveling disc golf camp where we're actually gonna take the kids by bus to different disc golf courses around the state of Vermont. Um, for the week, so they're going to visit like four different disc golf courses and play disc golf around the state. It's going to be kind of fun. I think I might um, enter both of my kids in that one actually because I'm loving some disc golf these days. Uh, we also, uh, on the disc, uh, since we're talking about discs, uh, Ultimate Frisbee. We, this will be the second year we're offering Ultimate Frisbee Camp. Last year we had 30 kids participate. We expect even more this year. Um, ultimate Disc, because you're not supposed to call Ultimate Frisbee anymore because Frisbee's uh, trademark, but Ultimate Disc or Frisbee um, is going to be a varsity sport this year um, throughout the state of Vermont. So the Vermont Principal Association has said starting this year, Ultimate is a varsity sport. Last year the club team at BHS had over 60 participants. So um, part of what we do with the Parks and Recreation Waterfront Department is look for trends, right? And so that's a trend where we're offering camp, kids are joining. Uh, a few years back, 10, 15 years ago, excuse me, it was lacrosse, right? And so we have 125 kids that are youth lacrosse program from about 25 to 125 in five or six years. So um, the current trend is ultimate frisbee. And there's going to be a lot of teams, like uh, probably 15 to 20 teams right off the bat um, in the state of Vermont playing ultimate frisbee this year as a, as a varsity sport. Along those same lines, Volleyball became a varsity sport for both boys and girls two years ago. Um, we were the only state in the nation, I got a little fact for you. We were the only state in the nation that did not have girls varsity volleyball as a varsity sport. 49 other states were the only one. So we're on board. So it's been two years. So this will be the second year where we're offering middle school and high school um, camps for volleyball. So that program is also growing at BHS. So uh, we're trying, you know, we try really hard to look at the trends and offer those camps. Uh, a couple other things. Um, we just received, we just got word last week, we received a $27,000 grant from the NRPA, which is the National Rock and Park Association, and the Walmart Foundation to expand our summer meals program. So for those of you who don't know, um, our summer meals program takes place at uh, five different sites throughout the city. And we're going to expand it to a sixth site this year. And that site is going to be the skate park. So with all the kids down at the skate park, 
So we, I just actually had a meeting. We just actually had a meeting with um, the Lake Champlain Sailing Center and the Burlington Food Service, um, Pat Matten and Doug Davis at Burlington Food Service, who were awesome. They organized the summer meals program for the city. Uh, and Lake Champlain Sailing Center is on board for all of their camps. We do three or four camps at the um, skate park as well. And we really feel like we're going to get a lot of walk-ins um, to that program because, you know, that with the beautiful redesign of the bike path, um, that is right now the middle of the waterfront when, you know, just three or four short years ago, it was like the end of the waterfront. Now it is the center, of, it's becoming the center of everything. So we're very excited to offer a free meals program there. Um, and very thankful to the NRPA and to the Walmart um, Corporation for providing these funds. The other part of this grant is um, joining summer meals programs for youth with senior meals programs. So a multi-generational piece. So this summer at the Old North End Community Center where the Champlain Senior Center is located, we have a daily meals program there. So um, four of our sites will be visiting once a week, Monday through Thursday, and doing eating meals with seniors and doing programming with seniors. So um, very excited to, to, to kick that off this summer also. I, I think that you know, we are, we're in a unique situation where we do both as a, as a city and as a department. We do a, a senior meals program and a youth meals program, and that really opened the door for this funding. So we're excited about that. So that's what I got. I'll take all questions. Yes? Yeah, if you need financial assistance for a parking pass, um, that program is in place. And if you call the main line at 864-0123, we'll put you in touch with the person you need to talk to for a parking pass. So we do offer free parking passes um, for folks who uh, need that assistance. Uh, and call the main line and um, we'll get that to you. Yes? Um, in case not everyone knows, can you explain more about the Power Keeper program? Sure, I, I love to explain about the Power Keeper program. We are very fortunate to have um, a group uh, here in the New North End called the Tower Keepers. K-E-Y-P-E-R-S. And uh, the Tower Keepers, um, starting in, well, it'll be a couple weeks probably now, depending on what, how the weather goes. Is that when you start? Mother's Day. Mother's Day, um, Mother's Day to Columbus Day. Every, every day, um, some of the Tower Keepers opens the tower in the morning and then closes it at dusk. Um, we've actually done a couple of um, 5K running events with the Tower Keepers in the past. Uh, and they're a fantastic volunteer organization. Um, like many of ours, Tower Keepers, Friends of Letty Park, who very much are involved here in the New North End, um, uh, are a volunteer group that helps with the trees. There are very many organizations, and we're very lucky to have the Tower Keepers. Anything you'd like to add about the Tower Keepers? Just that we're always looking for volunteers. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, if you'd like to be a Tower Keeper, please contact the main line. Um, Dan Cahill actually is the contact for that, but if you call the 0123 number, we'll get a hold of Dan for you. Yeah, so this is the brochure. It came out in North Avenue News um, about, I would say it's like three weeks ago now. So if you, if you have it in your house, please look at it. It's got lots of great stuff in it. It is available in most public buildings around the city. Uh, the, oh, the last thing I'd like to say is uh, I, there are flyers in the back um, planning for Letty Park. There will be a meeting here, uh, a workshop on April 9th from 5.30 to 8 to talk about um, some strategies for planning for Letty Park. Because um, we're looking at some different renovations. We're looking at uh, potentially a new tree shop um, being on site and uh, potentially a pavilion. Uh, some, some different ideas for Letty Park and we're looking for public input. So that meeting is April 9th at 5.30. Thank you very much for having me. And Gary, by the way, and, and on the, uh, the um, ultimate team won the state championship at BHS. The BHS club team won the state championship? Yeah, All right, so this so year, job, this year is going to be official, right? If they can, if they can defend it, they'll officially the state championships Vermont Principal Association. That's awesome. <laughs> so <clears throat> as, uh, as one of the, <clears throat> as one of the tower keepers that, and you know, Gary helped us uh, put together the, the 5K runs that we've had in the park in the fall in the last two years. 
I can attest that he actually runs as fast as he talks. <laughs> so that works. <laughs> well, thank you, Gary. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're <clears throat> we're conserving our time quite well, I think. Uh, so our our next speaker is uh, um, Alicia DeMarco DeMario, who's the executive director of. Birchwood Terrace, and you have, uh, expand, yep, which we will, can I get some help here? To, I, I'll just put it on the board if that's okay. Okay, yes. So there are uh, <coughs> expansion development plans at Birchwood Terrace that she would like to share with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, as i uh, mentioned, my name is Alicia DeMario, and I'm the executive director at Birchwood Terrace. And for those of you who may not know who we are or what we do, we are a 144-bed skilled nursing facility here on the north end of Burlington on the corner of Star Farm and uh, North Avenue. And we um, have a 50-bed uh, special care certified memory care unit, Alzheimer's dementia unit, a 54-bed long-term care unit, and a 40-bed rehab. And um, we've got a lot going on at the facility, uh, but part of the reason I am here is to talk about, um, talk about an issue that came up actually back in August of 2017, um, which you're saying, well, that was a long time ago, and yes, it was, but it's taken us about a year and a half to come to some, sort of a, some form of resolution to our problem. So back at that time, um, the city had put in an ordinance where there was no longer going to be parking along Star Farm Avenue in front of the school. And at that time, um, what that did was it forced a lot of traffic uh, into and onto our property. Some of that was uh, guests and visitors, some of it was folks from the school, some of them were our own employees. But really what that did was it created uh, kind of a parking jam within uh, our community which led to a lot of parking on some grass areas. So we received a notice of uh, violation for parking for the facility um, with immediate compliance uh, requested. So really what that, uh, what that came to fruition was that the city had our facility zoned for 45 parking spaces. Now, state and federal guidelines and requirements have minimum parking, uh, minimum, excuse me, minimum staffing requirements for a facility like ours. Um, and we roughly, on average, uh, at our high peak hours, have roughly about 95 cars in our parking lot. So zoning uh, for 45 was really quite inadequate just for staffing alone, let alone guests, visitors, physicians, vendors, anybody who wanted to come visit their loved ones at the facility. Um, so uh, that really kind of um, precipitated a very long uh, discussion with the city about how we might be able to come into better compliance. Uh, really what that led to is they said you needed immediate compliance and so we worked very hard uh, to find out where we could park, uh, which was in the neighboring neighborhood in Gray Meadows. Uh, that was not well received. Uh, as you can imagine, when you have 40 additional cars lining your streets and kind of blocking your mailboxes and um, garbage cans, um, God bless them, but they did a nice peaceful protest uh, one morning uh, and made a lot of calls to the city and the city kindly said, please bring all your people back into your parking lot and we will work together to come up with a resolution. So the problem was really twofold for us is that um, as in a residential zoning district, we were only allowed 35% lot capacity, which we already exceeded with our current parking situation. So that was our first barrier. The second barrier was that the current city zoning ordinance for this type of facility only allows one space for every four residents. So um, at 46 spaces, we were capped there as well. So throughout this past year and a half, we've been working with the city very diligently to kind of take a look at this uh, as, as a whole and say, you know, this doesn't make a lot of sense for what we do in the population we serve. Um, the first initial reaction was to build a two-story parking structure by Gray Meadows, which we quickly said that is not going to, to work. Um, let's work together to come up with something different. Um, 
So the city at that point agreed to allow us to um, be considered a senior housing, which then uh, automatically increased our lot capacity to 40%. So with that, we checked to see how much additional parking we could get, and it allowed us some, uh, it allowed us an, a, a roughly an additional 30 spaces. So that brings us to 75. Um, so that was our big victory. Uh, we went in front of the DRB uh, the beginning of the year, and they agreed to allow us to exceed the maximum parking requirements um, because we're really only allowed 45. So that's our big victory at this point, the additional 30 spaces. It's still not adequate, but it is certainly better than what we what were um, allotted at this point. So just roughly, just to show you what this is going to allow for us to do, this is really a two phase. When we approach the DRB, we let them know that we're going to approach this in two phases. The first was to ask for a waiver to exceed the maximum parking capacity, which is what they've granted. The second phase is we're going to go in front of them again, um, hopefully in the next couple months, and ask them to uh, revise the zoning ordinance for parking requirements for this type of facility. Uh, because it really needs to be about one space for every two residents versus one to four. And we have enough land to make this work with what we have without any additional traffic coming onto those streets. So we think we've got a good shot. But really what we're looking to do, we actually just have two small lots here currently, and we're actually just going to expand them further down towards North Ave. Um, we're going to enhance all of our all of our um, screenage. We're going to put better screening here um, with our landscape. We've been working with a landscape architect, um, and we've got a really beautiful design plan. Uh, we've been given till August 1st to complete this project. Um, they granted us a little bit of a, an extension because um, during this time, our staff are going to need places to park. So the school was kind enough to allow us during the summer months to park over in that parking lot so it didn't interrupt our service or our care to folks with um, giving staff an opportunity to get to and from work. Um, I'm still currently looking um, at options to see how we can or, or how and where we will park the additional 20 vehicles uh, after August 1st that typically come to our lot. Um, we want to make sure that we have plenty of spaces for uh, guests and visitors. Uh, most of the guests and visitors that come to visit folks in our facility um, are frail, and so obviously having uh, close parking and accessibility to come visit their loved ones is going to be very uh, important. So that must mainly mean that staff are going to have to be parking off-site at some point. So we're still looking at those options. Um, we've contacted, in the past, we've contacted St. Mark's and um, the Elks Lodge and a couple different churches. We've contacted... Pomelo Realty to see uh, what they might be able to do to help, but really at the end of my day, my goal is to make sure that we're minimizing the impact on residents. And anytime you have to have your staff parking off site, uh, it creates a barrier for them to get to work to provide care. So um, we're taking a, a hard look at that because at the end of the day, I can't impact patient care. They're my priority, their needs need to be met, and, and that's really what we're here for. So we're making some progress on this. We plan on, on going back and asking for, um, for uh, again, an amendment to the current zoning laws with the thought that we would add a third parking lot here, which would give us plenty of parking. So that's really what we're going for. My fingers are crossed. Um, the city has been very kind to work with us uh, as long as they have, and um, we're going to continue along that, that path. Um, just some additional news, I guess, from the facility standpoint is um, December 15th, we had a change of ownership. We had been a Kindred uh, facility for the last 20 plus years, and Kindred decided that they were going to get out of the long-term care business. They had 100 plus facilities nationwide, and they ended up selling them all, with uh, Birchwood and Star Farm being the last in their line of business to sell. Part of that is because of uh, the process the state of Vermont has to have changes of ownerships and facilities like this. Um, when we came here about six months ago, both of the new owners were, were here. Um, their names are Isaac Rubin and Ari Ehrlichman. Um, their commitment is not only to the residents in the facility, but to the community at large. 
And so they're very regretful that they were unable to be here today. They have been here for the last two days, uh, but had a prior commitment this evening. Um, wonderful men, um, very, good to the, very good to the facility and to the staff. Um, they have a big plan for a remodel of the facility. Um, for those of you who have been there, we're 53 years old. Uh, and I have to believe that the curtains are original. Um, so I'm really looking forward to some of the upgrades uh, that, they're, that they have planned. Part of the holdup for the upgrades was that we needed to get through our annual survey. I didn't want to be in the middle of a construction project during survey. Our survey concluded today, and I'm very proud to say we were deficiency free, which is a big feat in our line of work. So we're very proud of the work that we're doing there. Um, and that's the second time in three years that that's occurred. So really unheard of, we're really happy. Um, but some of the things that they're looking to do, and if you've been in our facility, you won't recognize this, but they're very much looking to modernize the facility. Um, so this would be when you come in the front lobby. Uh, and if you have been there recently, this is uh, uh, lovely shades of pink and blue wallpaper. Um, so it, it's going to be much, much different. And we really want it to be a destination for folks. Um, we're really proud of the, where we work. Um, I believe we provide the best care in town, and it's nice to have a building that hopefully will reflect that as well. So um, we've got a lot of exciting things occurring, so hopefully within the next couple months we'll have some construction going on and, and give the facility a facelift. So we're really excited about that as well. Are there any questions for me? You very yes. quickly said we rejected a two-story parking lot. Why not two or three stories and solve all the problems? Well, the, the big solution uh, to that was to clear cut that two acre piece of wood uh, on near Gray Meadows. And it's, you know, one of, to clear cut a two acre piece of wood, a uh, wooded area to build a multi-million dollar parking structure really wasn't feasible and it's very difficult to maintain as well. And it, certainly the neighbors in Gray Meadow, it's the only barrier between the facility and the neighborhood and it just was not well received. simply a band-aid so what what are you guys gonna do if you if you keep growing and you keep expanding there's gonna you're gonna very quickly come up against this again well we're not expanding we haven't expanded our services at the facility in 20 plus years so when I say we're expanding we're we're doing a facelift but we're not ex we're not um, we're not increasing our capacity We have always had this amount of traffic. It only became much more prevalent when the parking ban came on and all of those folks that were lining the streets are now coming onto the, into the parking lot. So it's really not increasing traffic at all. Um, we don't have any more employees than we have had in the past. There's, we can't exceed that amount of, uh, of 144 residents. The capacity will, will remain the same. And we're landlocked. There's no place for us to go other than up. And I don't necessarily see that happening anytime soon either. So it's really not um, expanding or exceeding anything we're doing now. It's just simply managing the, the same flow and the same traffic, um, but more responsibly, instead of parking on the grass, creating parking lots to do so. But you said you're still short 20 or 30 spaces. With this, even, with the additional, even with the additional 30 spaces now, it's not going to be adequate. So I'm working feverishly to figure out how and where. We're looking at incentive programs for staff as far as carpooling, uh, taking public transportation. Part of the issue is, is with a 24-7 operation, public transportation, even though we have a bus stop right at the end of the road, it is limited uh, to the times that the that public transportation comes to that area. We've actually, we've got a corporate Uber account and a Lyft so that we can help try to get people to and from work. Um, and you know we're just trying to get through a brief period of time until hopefully we can get that additional third lot and bring everybody back on site. Which uh, 
Which, uh, which street is which? Um, this is Star Farm Road. Right, that's what I thought. Yeah, and this is North Ave. Okay. Yeah. Who owns the property at the west end of that building, your building? The very west end, that two acre lot, yeah. wood lot, is ours as well. And you're not, you can't do anything with that? We don't really want to do anything with that. Right. Um, you know, to, to cut down woods, to, to create a parking area where we're already existing, currently parking doesn't make a ton of sense. And it, quite honestly, the folks in Gray Meadows, you know, not, not a fan. I mean, it's a nice little barrier to have with, with the folks in those neighborhoods. Yeah. I respect that for sure. I'm just curious why this parking ban on the street went into effect? I think it went into effect primarily because there was some concern about, um, about um, people or children getting hit crossing the road or with cars parked along. It's kind of hard to see as if you're a vehicle coming down that street. I really think it was meant for the protection of children. Um, I, I think it un had the unfortunate side effect of, of this, of creating a parking problem for us, but um, we're working on it. So um, the question I have is, is if this is, if, if you sort of are in need of more parking, um, you know, my husband and I, we work during the day, we live right on Aldridge Street. Yep. Have you sort of talked to some local residents about, you know, I'm happy to offer up, you know, my driveway um, if part of the issue is you don't have enough uh, parking. You know, we're not using our driveway when we're at work. You're more than welcome to, you know, have, a, have a, an employee park there if you're having a parking issue. And I'm certainly, uh, you know, I'm happy to talk to the residents in the area to see if that's a possible solution to some of the overflow that you may be experiencing. And, and I would greatly appreciate that. I, pretty much our peak hours are during shift change during the day. And we do stagger our shifts um, so that not everybody is coming in at the same time and everybody is going off. So the, obviously the big bulk of our um, employers, uh, employees are the nursing staff. Um, and so we have the nurses aides, the one who are doing the direct care. They come in a half hour earlier than the licensed nurses to help with that problem as well. Um, but there is about an hour from two to three in the afternoon where, where that flow is so heavy um, that it often exceeds what we're capable of, of doing. So I, I would greatly appreciate that. That would yeah, be very let's helpful. Let's have a conversation afterwards. You're Wonderful, welcome. thank you. So thank you for, I drive by your facility every day. So I live Hi. on the Star Farm Road. So thank you for your commitment preserving those woods. <laughs> You're welcome. Torn down, and it does seem like it would be a sensible approach. If you need any advocacy, I'd be happy to, as far as increasing your parking into that what's currently lawn. Yes. And I guess the only issue I would have is let's, if there's any way to do that with semi-pervious or pervious pavers so we could manage stormwater runoff and that was part of the problem because we exceed lot capacity. What they were hoping that we would do, part of the, I learned a lot about zoning laws during this. Um, they're quite fascinating and quite complicated. Uh, but the zoning uh, ordinance specifically indicates that you cannot use pervious and impervious for parking. So really what they wanted us to do was they wanted us to pull up our fire lanes which are currently impervious and lay pervious pavers. The problem with that is the fire department said absolutely <laughs> not, absolutely not. Um, so we kind of got into a little bit of a battle with, and it's not really safe for seniors if you're putting impervious pavers. We have frost heaves, they raise, they lower. Um, so to me that wasn't a really viable option just because of what we do in the clientele we have. Um, so what we are looking at doing though with this is really providing enhanced stormwater drainage and we're doing with this current project that's going to be completed by August 1st, we're, we're creating enough stormwater drainage and enhancing it enough where that even when we add this third lot it's going to be covered in the original plan. So it sounds like you're right on top of it, so I appreciate that. I've been working hard. Yeah, so but and, and just compliment you on the facility because it's definitely the type of resource that we need in the community. So definitely be 
encouraging everybody to make sure that uh, we don't make your life unnecessarily difficult. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Any other questions? And thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Hey, Alicia, thank you very much. Very thorough presentation. We appreciate that. Yes. All right. Our next presentation is uh, from the Public's Work Department. And we have uh, Director Chavin Spencer and <coughs> Olivia DeReese. Yep, is the uh, <coughs> the engineer on staff who's currently working on the unsignalized crosswalk project. And although the uh, the original invitation to DPW for this meeting was spring update, and <coughs> and. Uh, DPW was planning on coming to the April meeting to do general updates. So actually the, the primary focus of the presentation tonight is on the status of the unsignalized crosswalk project on North Avenue. So um, that's going to be the focus of, of your discussion, correct? Okay, so uh, I haven't met you in person, so Olivia, that's you. I'm just going to give it to Chapin first so he can use Thanks so much for having us uh, this evening. I have with me Senior Engineer Susan Malzahn and Olivia Doris, who's a Public Works Engineer. We're excited to tell you about the status of the uh, North Avenue on signalized crosswalks or watch a little of the uh, <laughs> March Madness. <laughs> you decide. Uh, we will... Uh, we will help keep on time. Congrats on the successful uh, facilitation of the meeting. Uh, we are, to cut to the chase, uh, excited to tell you uh, this construction project will be underway by the end of next month. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Reese to run through a short presentation that will answer any questions. Thanks, Chapin. Um, hi, I'm Olivia Dries, again, Public Works Engineer. I'm the current project manager on this project. Um, and to give a brief overview, um, not that they're present, but um, we did have uh, Lemero and Dickinson consulting engineers as a design engineer on this project. <coughs> Don at Weston Excavating has been selected as the contractor <coughs> and Stantec Consulting Services as uh, for the resident engineering services on this project. Um, <coughs> a quick project overview for those of you who may not be completely familiar with the scope of this project. Um, it does involve um, <clears throat> five, a total of five new crosswalks, um, Ward Street, Killarney Drive, and Village Green Drive, Poirier Place, Goss Court, and Dawes Court, Green Acres Drive, and uh, Cayuga Court. Um, just a brief, a brief project history. Uh, this project is a product of the North Avenue, 2015 North Avenue Corridor Study. Um, through that corridor study, um, a total of nine potential crosswalk locations um, were um, brought up for discussion and input um, among the public and among the North Avenue Corridor Public Advisory Committee. Um, of those nine uh, potential locations, um, Though those locations were voted on and ultimately uh, led to the selection of these five locations for implementation based on, um, again, public input, um, the need, the proximity to bus stations, um, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> the city did obtain a federal grant through the Vermont Agency of Transportation for the completion of this project, um, which alleviated some of um, the money that would have been otherwise needed um, from uh, taxpayer dollars. Um, this amount is about $220,000, which was, which is great. Um, that does mean that we, there are a certain amount of um, federal guidelines and protocols that we have to follow, um, which does stretch out the timeline a little bit. Um, so the timeline. Um, in March 2016, uh, the design consultant. Uh, was selected, and from March 2016 to July 
2016 was um, project initiation, ground survey, um, and in 2016, July 2016, started um, public outre outreach efforts, utility coordination, um, all the federal and state processes, which included the project permitting and investigation, um, environmental assessments, right of way planning and ac acquisition, and of course the design work and construction estimates. Um, I'll elaborate a little bit more on those steps in the next slide, but um, in July 2017, City of Council approved the North Avenue uh, lane reconfiguration, and that solidified um, the project scope um, to what it is today. Um, <coughs> Pre, we're currently in the pre-construction phase. Um, back in January, we um, posted the project, put the project out to bid, um, and we got a, a couple, a couple of proposals. Um, since then, we have selected a contractor and a resident engineer, and we are slated to go to construction at the end of next month. Um, so, federal fi funding requirements, as I previously touched on. Um, there's a number of requirements that we need to follow to use federal dollars. Um, first and foremost is to execute a cooperative agreement um, with the state of Vermont. Um, we have to use external design consultants. We cannot use our own forces to, to design the project. Um, it, there's a very iterative um, design and review process uh, with the Vermont Agency of Transportation and, and the federal government. Um, we're re required to um, make a number of submittals, including conceptual plans, preliminary plans, final plans, conceptual plans, and project estimates. And those all require a um, certain number of weeks, even, even months, to um, to, to work through through VTrans, so it's a it's a pretty lengthy process. Um, we need to process federal and environmental documentation through FHWA. This includes environmental assessments. Make sure that we're not um, negatively impacting um, the environment and um, causing um, um, an increase in in impervious. Um, an overall uh, increase in impervious um, surfaces that um, we can't counteract. Um, we have to go through a, a right-of-way phase. Um, again, a very iterative process that requires um, right-of-way plans, acquisition, right-of-way clearance um, from the city and from VTrans. Um, we have to obtain utility clearances and we have to procure construction uh, contract again because um, we're not allowed to use any of our own forces for for um, any construction operations. So um, some of the crossing features include um, re uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons or RFBs. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with um, several of these throughout town, in including uh, Pine Street. Um, they're Pedestrian initiated um, flashing beacons, they're, they're pretty great. Um, ADA accessible concrete sidewalk ramp, so that makes facilities accessible for, for everybody and safe. Um, it will be providing new crossing facilities at exist, existing bus stop locations where they're greatly needed today. Um, <clears throat> feature, one good feature is a, a bump out on Ward Street, which is I have, I think I have a photo um, later, but it just kind of, it's a, like a curb extension that goes into the road. Um, so it uh, enhances the visibility for pedestrians and shortens uh, the crossing distance. Um, Paint and center line median, medians on some of the intersections to narrow the travel, travel lanes. Um, this produces a tra traffic calming effect at a couple of the intersections. Um, new street lights to meet lighting standards for crosswalks and restriping existing crosswalks. Um, just a quick photo of the RFBs. Again, a lot of you are probably familiar with these, but they're solar powered and they have a pedestrian push button, then they just flash and, and make pedestrians visible to oncoming traffic. 
Um, just an example of one of the intersections this is Cayuga Court and Green Acres Drive. So here we have the painted medians that kind of narrow the travel way approaching the intersection. Um, I think these are, yeah, these are repainted crosswalks, um, new um, ADA compliant um, sidewalk ramps, um, and our new street lighting and RFBs will be located at this crosswalk here. Um, traffic controls, always a concern for good reason. Um, traffic's going to be maintained in accordance with state and federal specifications. Um, the contractor will be required to submit um, traffic control plans, which will be reviewed by DPW, um, myself included, the resident engineer, VTrans, um, so we can make sure that we're maintaining a safe, um, safe and um, well-operating um, uh, traffic and um, we don't anticipate any um, significant traffic um, disru disruptions um, we'll occasionally have to close a lane or close a shoulder to make room for um, some striping or for maybe some curb work but we don't anticipate any closures or any major disruptions like that um, we will if any major disru disruptions do pop up or um, even even minor ones, um, we will communicate that to the public well beforehand. Um, and pedestrian access will be maintained throughout the project site at all times. So um, that's it for me. Any, any questions? So um, I live on Cayuga Court and I cross there pretty often with my two-year-old to get to the bus stop because it's on the other side of the street. Um, so I, I guess my question is if, you know, you're aiming to get this done by August, but if it doesn't get done this construction season, what's the backup plan to make sure that no one else loses their life on North Ave? Because that happened this year. This project will get completed this year. Uh, the hardest part of getting this project uh, completed is where we've come to today. At this point, with a construction contract signed, uh, we are ready to go. And I'm excited that Olivia has joined the team here at Public Works. She's a new engineer for us to give us the capacity to get this project across the finish line. So uh, you have my word that we will get it done this season. It's, it sounds to me like an awful lot of the cost of this is, comes from the feds. Was it worth taking all that money from them? I'll bet you, we, if nothing else, all this money has to go out to the city, we could be paying locals to design it and do the right things. I, I don't want their money. And I, don't, I bet you, you two engineers could have done it much cheaper if you'd just done it with logic and not federal rules. Sure, I'll take a, a stab at that. It's a good question. Uh, we have been able to use, while yes, we couldn't use our own internal staff, we were able to use external staff, which allowed our team to focus on other projects. So I will acknowledge, and let's not uh, kid ourselves, all those extra steps do require extra time and extra resources. But fundamentally, uh, the, it is a net positive to the local taxpayer for us to bring in these external funds. Uh, we were able, because we outsourced the design work, to get uh, <coughs> seven miles of paving done last year over three miles of sidewalk and a number of other projects. So I hear your point. It, it does cost us extra money. It is still a net positive. Uh, what's going to be the overall cost of this? And I would remind everybody, it's not federal money. It's our money. It's tax money. It is. So the total cost of the project is $330,000. So with the $220,000, about $110,000 of local match and, yeah, local match. Um, my question is, can, I wanted to see a picture of the bump out and I wanted to see if that's possible to do in other, air, in other streets and how do you determine that that's a good bump out or that street deserved one as opposed to the other ones. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and can you clarify how many RFVs will be per crosswalks? So I think total is five separate. Yes. Uh, so one on each, one on each side for okay. each crosswalk. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so as far as the bump outs go, um, the bump out works here because we have um, parking on either side of the bump out. Um, for some areas, it doesn't. We don't necessarily have that extra width, or perhaps there's there are other plans for uh, that corridor. There's there's bike lanes that we just can't put a bump out across. Sometimes there's stormwater that we have to think about. Um, this one we were able to make it work with the stormwater, um, but there it kind of just depends on on the intersection and and the overall plans for that for the street. Mm -hmm. Show the list of where they're going to be again. I'm interested in what's in front of Cambrian Ledge or whatever it's called. And so these are the locations that are going to get constructed through this grant. In addition, there will be two crosswalks uh, across Cambrian, from Cambrian Rise across North Avenue as well that are getting constructed by the developer and not by us. Yes, the northern crosswalk was put in. There will be another one at their south road, and then they're planning on relocating. There's currently a, a mid-block crossing over to the gas station. Uh, they're going to be moving that slightly to come out where the shared use path comes up from the Burlington bike path and hits North Avenue to facilitate an old north end to bike path connection. I just... Sorry, um, that crosswalk doesn't currently have a signal on it. Is is that crosswalk at Cambrian Rise going to have a signalized crossing? I don't think that there will be one to start. Not to start. We can evaluate it in the future. Um, I just want to say thank you. I'm really excited about the work that you're doing, and I think it's a good use of tax dollars to make our community safer and more livable. And as school commissioner, I'm glad that our students will have a safe place to cross the avenue. So thank you very much. Thank you. I also wanted to say thank you for putting the hard work into this. The, the one question I do have is, are you going to also be installing the chirping devices so that folks who are blind will be able to know when the lights have changed? Yeah, those will, those are, Typical to RFB, all RFB. Um. Uh, just to be clear, for RFBs, it does not stop motorists. So while, yes, there will be some audible indication that the lights are on, this is a different situation than a signalized intersection where a pedestrian gets a walk signal and there's an audible note to let them know that they have a uh, uh, right to enter the crosswalk. So. Just note that these are advisory devices, and we ask pedestrians to wait for traffic really to yield before they enter the crosswalk. You you mentioned that um, Ward Street is going to have a bump out, and there's parking on both sides of the street. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that when we did the North Avenue corridor study, that Phase Two was going to um, remove parking on the south end of North Avenue. Um, is that still going to happen? Uh, so it's a good question. Uh, there is parking uh, only on one side of North Avenue down by Ward Street. Uh, the in, what Olivia, I think, was saying was parking on both sides of the bump out on that same side of the street. So uh, there is a northbound bike lane in that location. Uh, the uh, Plan BTV walk bike did uh, come up with the concept of greenways and helping people get around and off busy streets. So one of the recommendations uh, prior to parking being uh, potentially removed on that section of North Avenue was to create a neighborhood greenway on Lake U Terrace. And so those signs and markings are expected to go in this year. Yeah, but when you were doing the North Avenue um, by quarter study, the, the thought was that you were removing parking in our neighborhood and also it was going to happen in the south end. and for you to say that they're now, the bikes are now going on Lakewood Estates or Lakeview Terrace. Lake Terrace, yeah. Um, the, the bikers very adamantly said you wouldn't drive to 
Montpelier to go to, or you wouldn't drive to St. Albans to go to Montpelier. So I, I don't understand why that philosophy isn't still working and why parking isn't being removed from the south end of North Avenue as was promised. So one of the pieces as we unfold the Plan BTV walk bike is we do look for where we have active paving projects and other construction projects. This uh, last year we removed parking on lower uh, Pine Street. This year we're proposing going to the commission to remove parking on Flint Avenue to start implementing that plan. Uh, we can and did discuss in the North Ave corridor the possibility of removing parking on that western side of uh, North Avenue. That is not an active uh, request at this point or an active project, yeah. but is in, we, ha we haven't implemented all of the plan yet, so we haven't uh, initiated that effort yet. Do you all have um, more presenting about North Avenue and construction on North Avenue? Um, Was tonight's presentation just about the crosswalks? That's what we had understood. We are we have, are planning to come back in April to do the whole construction season, soup the nuts, uh, and have a, uh, an overview to hand out. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> DPW does have a agenda request in with the steering committee to come back and talk about the, all the other projects at the April meeting. Paving bids just came back Tuesday, so we're uh, still tweaking things and would have a much better uh, update for you in, in April. Uh, thanks for all the improvements you've done around the city. I, uh, especially the last summer, there was an incredible amount of work done. Um, and I really appreciate the improvements for bicyclists in town and I'm looking forward to more this summer. Um, but one thing that I was, and uh, this uh, presentation kind of explains um, why it's taken so long for crosswalks on North Avenue, but I'm, I'm still um, miffed that, um, you know, in, I walk around the Old North End and the Hill section a lot, because I work at UVM, and we have the fancy flower pots with the white, you know, traffic calming devices. And I know those cost money to put in. Why do those have priority over crosswalks on North Avenue? where we're just trying to cross the street, you know? And, and I see it's like different pots of money. Right, and your, your insight is correct. Uh, we were able, with this federal funding source, to apply for durable infrastructure, capital dollars. A lot of what you're seeing with the flowers uh, and the bollards are not uh, durable infrastructure that we could have applied for that type of funding for. Uh, local dollars uh, are more flexible dollars and can be implemented more quickly. Uh, that's part of our quick build program and the intent of that is to experiment and deploy. And if successful, then we can install curb and the expensive uh, capital improvements that are durable for the long term. Okay. Thanks. It just would have been nice to see them last summer. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I will say we had four other federally funded pedestrian projects over the last seven, eight years. This North Avenue Crosswalk project will be the quickest of getting from grant funding to construction. Okay. Uh, we did the Cliff Street sidewalk, we did the Flynn Avenue sidewalk, those took six to eight years. We did the, um, well the one we haven't gotten to yet, the Champlain uh, Elementary Pedestrian Improvement Project is still moving towards construction and then we had the Colchester Avenue project which took a similar amount of time. So. I acknowledge that four years seems like a long time, and it, and it is, but this is going to be a durable improvement for generations. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, thank you, sir. And Colchester Avenue, you know, we have a crosswalk there, but it's always very hard for drivers <laughs> to see the beacon flashing in the morning. And I was just wondering, for here, do you have any plan in making sure that um, the car drivers can see the beacon driving, especially in the beginning when they insult? Sure. Um, one of the things, we talked about how many RFPs will there be. One of the things we have done in Burlington as our standard design is not only have the RFPs on both sides of the road, but have the lights flashing 
both directions. So there's really four sets of rapid flashing beacons, two facing one way, two the other. That's the city going over and above to ensure that drivers are going to see. North Avenue is also a north-south road, not experiencing the same kind of early morning or late evening, kind of driving into the sun and not being able to see these. And our engineering team has worked hard to locate these and ensure sight lines so that they will be safe. Yeah. You get a number of bollards between the police department and Park Street. How many times are they going to get knocked down before you give it up and just leave it alone? Thank you, Pat. Um, so we have uh, worked on uh, enhancing our uh, pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure. Uh, we are exploring these quick build installs that are lower cost to try out uh, these designs and then figure out how to tweak it, adjust it, uh, before we consider making an expensive capital improvement. Uh, I do acknowledge that that has been a difficult area. It's been a difficult area for our plow teams to navigate around those. Uh, and I give uh, our plow team a lot of credit for navigating Burlington's narrow streets. Um, we are taking that experience and saying, okay, what do we do there? Uh, there is predominant left turn there from, uh, from Battery onto uh, Sherman Street there. So uh, it is one that our team is looking and reviewing. We just installed it last year and trying to figure out how to improve protection while uh, being able to maintain it through the year and provide it safe for drivers. It is a complicated balance and we're still working on it. Okay, thank you. We look forward to seeing you in April and we'll be in touch to finalize the agenda topics for April. Great, thank you so much for having well, us. Yep. Anybody would like um, my business card um, for some contact information, you can see me. I'm happy to hand them out. Okay, so for the final uh, segment of our meeting, uh, I'm going to in invite our, well, we have two of our city council folks here and two, or, uh, and two of our school board people and two of our city council folks here up to the table. Um, we were <coughs> in, no, come on up, yes. We were informed that the two uh, state reps, um, Mr. Hooper and um, Gene O'Sullivan, <coughs> are delayed in Montpelier, so, so they're not available. So, <coughs> the other, um, We'll get you some microphones in a minute, folks. But um, the other, uh, in introducing this segment of our meeting, um, the steering committee is really trying to enhance the concept of dialogue. So um, <clears throat> unlike past meetings, we're actually going to start this meeting with our, uh, you know, access to our elected officials with questions from the audience so that we can begin this segment with dialogue and questions that are on your mind. And then if uh, school board or city council folks have specific messages that you want to deliver, then that will be an opportunity to do that in responding to some of the questions. So again, uh, focus on dialogue and kind of turn this dynamic around a little bit. So. Um, I'm going to give up my microphone, or for if anybody has any. <clears throat> Actually, let's do it this way, Jeff. If if you can give the microphone to folks who have questions, and I'll give our, the speaker table the other one. Okay. Make sure they're working. My first question is, why can't the snowplows get closer to the curb? 
why can't the sidewalks in Burlington be cleared to the point you don't have to climb a mountain to put a coin in the, the parking meter? And the one that's dear to my heart is, when are we going to get a sidewalk or turn our street back into a dead end? Cottage Grove. We just missed Mr. Spencer here. The, he would have been the... the but uh, I, I'll just say, I know, I know what you're talking about. Uh, so, Mr. Spencer, uh, we're talking about the, the snowplow distance to the road and, and uh, preventing those mounds up, uh, between the parking meters. Um, and then the second question from the, the gentleman is regarding the end of Cottage Grove. I think there's been uh, some request from the neighbors in that area to, to, have you guys looked into, yeah, okay, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, uh, so on the first question around the parking meters, uh, it is quite time consuming to shovel around the parking meters. We do, once. Once we plow the streets and the sidewalks, we clear out some neighborhood streets that are too narrow to allow passage without removing snow. Then we move to removing snow downtown, and we do it on uh, overnights from 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. so that we can get around without parked cars in the way. Um, we, to do that more efficiently, one of the things we're doing, uh, as you see on St. Paul Street that we're reconstructing, is we're going from parking meters to parking kiosks. So instead of having 20 poles or 30 poles that we have to go around and that we have to plow out to four kiosks per block that we can shovel out and give everybody safe access to those kiosks year round. So that's the first answer to help that issue. So the second is, uh, question of Cottage Grove. We have seven miles of, sidewalk of streets that have no sidewalk. We have 95 miles of total street. So you can do the math. There's a percentage of streets, including Cottage Grove, that do not have sidewalk. Cottage Grove is a challenging one in that the street and the right-of-way is very narrow. If we in, want to advance the sidewalk project there, uh, it is likely going to either remove parking or impact people's uh, green space next to their homes. It is a tight corridor. That said, our goal is to have a sidewalk along one side of every street in the city. We need to find grant funds to expand the sidewalk network. A lot of what we're doing is replacing sidewalk that's crumbling. We're trying to secure other people's money to expand the sidewalks uh, network. Thank you. So I, I, on my way to this meeting tonight, I drove down Cottage Grove because I've been seeing a lot of posts on Front Porch Forum about that situation. And I do occasionally use that as a shortcut, particularly when the schools, when the app, if I need to come down Star Farm Road, if, when the school's getting out and everybody is making that congested, sometimes I do use that. And I try to be cognizant of not driving fast there. Would it be feasible to close that off and a dead end street again and force people you know, make it not an option for people from my neighborhood to drive through? Um, would it be even feasible to do a survey of the residents there? Two questions. One, would the residents who are there support it? And, you know, when Great Birch came in, it, it ceased being a, uh, a dead end street. Should we get a dead end street again? Um, I, excuse, all right, I'm going to uh, ex exercise my moderator prerogative here and try to refocus the conversation with our elected officials and unfortunately ask that some of that conversation is going to have to, we're going to have to save that to April when DPW comes back if we want to talk about street configuration. So here we go, let's try this again. I have a question for um, one of the councilmen. Um, what can be done, if anything, about the camping that's going on in Letty Park um, near Hannaford's? So it's all done, if you notice, it's gone. It's gonna be removed every day it's there. It's gonna be removed every day if they come back, okay? So this has been an ongoing issue for a long time. 
Um, uh, I have worked hard. I have hurt. It is gone. It is gone as of Monday morning. And, it, and we were promised that it won't come back. Okay? Um, what's that? Burlington Police. Um, and so there's an ordinance, you know, in, in the city that, you know, no camping in our public parks. Um, I think we've been lax with that in, in certain parks, but this particular campsite was right near soccer fields, right near softball fields. Uh, we had a homeless veteran pass away there, oddly enough, on September 11th. Uh, a very, very nice man, a very great man, actually. Uh, and it was really, really sad. Uh, it was one of the initiatives I worked on this summer. I was really disappointed that there was no public statement issued on this man's death here in the New North End. The city did not acknowledge the death. What's that? Natural causes. He was a heavy, heavy drinker. I think he had a lot to drink that night. Um, but he visited my store every morning for coffee. I got to know him personally. He was a brilliant man. Uh, he chose to be homeless. He actually had an apartment on East Avenue in Burlington. He was very generous to the homeless people. He would come out and, and, and uh, kind of mingle with them and take care of them and buy them things. Uh, but he had chosen to be homeless. I think he had, had chosen that this is the way he, he kind of wanted to end his life, to be perfectly honest with you. But anyways, it was sad because I, I uh, contacted the city. I contacted CEDO. I wanted his death acknowledged. I wanted to make sure that his family knew he was a Vietnam vet. Uh, and uh, I didn't get very far with it. And I, and I know those things are kind of dicey, right? And they're, and they're private information, and it's hard to do. But anyways, getting back to the camp, it's gone. It's not a great place for one. I am one city councilor that I've advocated for years for a, a, a wet shelter, which we do have downtown. I've advocated for more money. We have a place in Burlington for people that have substance abuse problems that don't have to stay at night. They don't have to stay outside at night, right? The city has gotten better. We can do much better, but we've gotten better taking money out of our budget for the, for the shelter downtown. And so there is no reason for campsites, particularly in that particular site, uh, around so many kids and, and so many families. And so that site has been removed. Um, so, and it won't, it won't return. Did something change with the police that have people? I think that's a great segue in what I wanted to say. I am part of the Public Safety Committee. And in the Public Safety Committee, the city attorney, alongside with the police, Howard Center, they come up, yeah, um, they, they come up with um, an ordinance, homelessness, uncomfortable policy. That's what it's called. It's not adopted. Homelessness, uncomfortable policy. So basically, if homeless are camping somewhere where they're not supposed to, right? There is now a proper way in coming talking to them. The police alone cannot come and say, you need to get out of here. There should be, at least we give them warning, 30 days, 60 days. And in most cases, when the police should come, police should not come alone. Police should come with a professional, like a social worker, to speak with them and make sure that they have access to services. So they do intake. So basically, you take your name and also put you on a waiting list for a shelter. Now, there are also other elements of it. Basically, sometimes they, they leave their belongings, their bags, their stuff, and what the city is looking into right now. If we move them away, and sometimes they leave their stuff, and the city takes it, what the city will do with them? So now people are, you know, brainstorming ideas. Yes, we need to talk to this person who owns this, belong this building that he's not using. So we're figuring that out. But now ACLU, which is an organization, is getting involved into this. It's not done there. But tomorrow, we have the city, um, the public safety committee meeting. And I think that would be a hot topic where homeless people will be also coming to speak on their behalf. Now. Sometimes they camp in properties that doesn't belong to the city. But 
Yeah, but, and I think we have also an element where the community members need to weigh in. So what you're talking about this campment, I had no idea. I had no it existed. But at the same time, we have homeless, homeless people who are camping in the woods. They don't bother anybody. They don't want even all the homeless to come there. And the police have no problem with those people. But sometimes, public place or private place, sh people should not camp there. Uh, so, just wanted to add that. But tomorrow, I think the conversation will be interesting. It will be at City Hall at 5.30. Thank you. Thank you all for everything you're doing. Um, I did just want to ask um, the school board members if there was an update on the principal searches and if there are still any opportunities to participate in that process anyway. Um, sure. Uh, we have a little uh, hiring. Um, so there is a public forum on Monday, um, April 1st, from 6 to 8 at located at IAA. Um, a, focusing on hiring principals for IAA, SA, and um, Champlain School. Integrated Arts Academy, so the H.O. Wheeler. Um, and I don't know if you want the lowdown of all the principals in the town. So, <laughs> um, so Flynn, Flynn School here in the old, uh, New North End um, has an interim principal this year. Um, who unfortunately didn't apply for the position. Um, the search committee came up with three candidates, three best candidates. Uh, the superintendent um, chose uh, LaShawn Whitmore-Sells, who is currently the principal at SA, Sustainability Academy or Barnes, uh, to be moved to um, Flynn. However, the school board voted that move down. <coughs> And so now we're still trying to determine who has the final say in this. Um, and so, so this was uh, two weeks ago yesterday that we voted this move down. So it's taking a while to figure out what's going to happen there. Um, the high school uh, search um, ended up, we came down to one candidate, which is the current um, principal, Noel Green. Um, and the school board decided to extend his interim position for one year. And this was done a week ago, or maybe 10 days ago. And um, hopefully he will accept the interim position for one more year. And um, we will urge the superintendent to get the application process going sooner, get the ad out in October, so that by end of January, we're ready to make an offer. Because at this time, all the other candidates that applied have already accepted positions elsewhere. So, um, and then, yeah, just um, Monday at IAA or H.O. Wheeler Public Forum, 6 o'clock. Unfortunately, it overlaps with uh, city council swearing in ceremonies. Um, but I, there's nothing I can do about that. <laughs> So I just had a quick question. I saw a lot of um, posts on Front Porch Forum about the sort of increased costs of the park, and I'm just wondering if we can just shed some light on where those costs are coming from, because I saw a number of folks asking questions about where, where, why is this extra money and where is it coming from? Yes. So basically, you're saying why the park cost has gone up from 4.6 to 5, why the bids has changed? So I think there are, one of them is a council, you know, because we've been delaying this project for years since we started when I was city council. We needed to create an ad hoc committee, you know, and sometimes when you make an agreement with the developers, you have to respect it. And also the cost of materials, anything don't stay the same. Everything changes. And I think one other element is also the uh, the soil contamination, which they did find out back then. Um, and also, in one point, um, the city did not really look into um, the extra factors, 
like, like such as um, the environmental regulations and also waiting for some type of money. And I, I do definitely do think that where we are right now, it's not about why it went up, but why the council voted to move forward, even though we knew the cost has changed. But to me, what's really important as an elected official is downtown is the living room of the city. Downtown is not, should not be considered as any other neighborhood. It's where businesses is taking place, is where tourists are coming, it's where we go to enjoy the city. It should not be considered that way. But this city has a culture of group of people stepping up sometimes, and I said it before, many people don't like it, to sabotage. Involvement matter, engagement matter, but also when you elect people, you should let them, give them the trust to lead the work. And also you have, uh, you concern, you speak up, but at the same time, to not try to stop things or kill it. I don't think that, that, that is fair to people that we elect to do the work. But specifically for um, the park, I think what's important is the taxpayers, property taxes, it's not more than $1.25 million. And also my amendment that I introduced is for the mayor to keep on looking another $250,000 which passed also at the council, right? This park is going to be beautiful. This park is going to be wonderful. We all going to enjoy it. It is going to make Burlington stay competitive, stay the best in, in, in the region, you know? And at the same time, we will enjoy it. North Avenue, when we were driving the bike lane, huge problem. Many people didn't like it. And people who were against it come to me and say they enjoy it. Change is hard, right? That's just what I want. I'll just be brief on the park. Uh, it's either um, you, you wanted us to, to, to do the park, and it's a very expensive park. I'll be the first to say it. It was before the increases. Right? It's a, that's a big price tag uh, to redo City Hall Park. Do I think it desperately needed it? Yes. Do I, do I think that I, I would like to see our park as an extension of Church Street and welcoming for everybody and having shows and, and, and events in that park? I do. Okay. Uh, but with delays uh, came cost rise. I mean, we, you know, we, we tried to work with the Keep It Park Green people, which I have a lot of respect for, but you know, in that, in those delays and pushing the dates back, the rates went up, uh, you know, product goes up. Uh, SD Ireland, and the, two pe the two people that bid on the project are now telling us, you know, if we didn't have a deadline by March 31st, that they weren't, wouldn't be able to start the project this summer. You know, it's there's a lot of things. Councilor Nodell spoke to these things brilliantly Monday night, actually, to why costs go up in these things and what happens in these big projects. And I actually felt bad that we had taken some money away because this is my thought on this. It is a very expensive project. But if you're going to do it, you might as well do it right. And what we did Monday night is that we kind of, we kind of took the public bathrooms out. I mean, how do you do that? I mean, that was the big part of this thing, right? So right now, we approved this project, and I, and I spoke against this, right? We took the public bathrooms out, and then we took some beautiful granite work being done, which was expensive. I get it. And, but now it's just going to be concrete. So in 10 years, we'll be placing the concrete, right? Well, I mean, we just really didn't do this project justice, even on Monday night when we passed this, right? I would have been much for the price tag that was there Monday night, do the park once, do it right, and move on. But we chose not to because there were counselors that were uncomfortable about the price cost, and, and I understand that, but at the end of the day, you can pay now or you can pay later. And if we do these projects now and we think we're gonna put the bathrooms in later and we're gonna do the nice granite work later, the price tag's even gonna be more. And so that's very unfortunate. And so. It is what it is, but we'll go forward and we'll, we'll do the best we can with it. Any question over there? Um, hi, my name is Nancy, and I 
kind of an announcement because I couldn't get here early, but I want to invite everyone on April 11th to come back to the Miller Center um, regarding park. Um, Letty Park has got um, slated to have a lot of changes potentially done to it. It's time to make a lot of improvements. There's some interest in building a pump track there, which is a bike park similar to the skateboard park, but with sand and for bikes. Um, so, and improving trails and making other improvements. So they decided to have a meeting that will um, bring a lot of people and ideas can be shared and concerns can be made. But thanks for taking care of the um, homeless shelters. Yes, we will. Yep. Uh, April 11th. Six to eight here. And just for you that maybe might not realize it, there's a group that's been a, together for a long, long time. I've had the privilege to work with them over the years and assist them, but Friends of Letty Park. And that group is, is very strong. They'll all be here on the 11th. Uh, I've always said one of the best decisions I've ever made, and some people in this room might not like it, but you know, when I spoke up and made sure that Ultimate Frisbee, you know, the, the golf Frisbee would not go to Letty Park. And, and it turns out to be, I think, a good decision if when you look at the areas that they went to and the parks that they've ruined in Waterbury and other places that it's really, I, I've always thought that that was the right decision and Lady Park is a gem here and I hope everybody comes on the 11th because it, it's a big meeting and it will be the future of Lady Park. So I hope you can all come, I'll be here as well. Um, can I ask for clarification because Gary Rogers was here, spoke earlier, <laughs> And the flyer he handed out says April 9th. Okay. So is there a distinction between? No. I think it's the 9th. Okay. Right. So there are some flyers. Here at the Miller Center. Correct. So it, yeah, thank you, Nancy, but it is April 9th. Okay. So as we are getting close to wrap up, um, <clears throat> I want to sort of go back to the table and ask if the School board folks have something additional to say, and also um, Councilor elect Polino give you a few minutes as well. So, yep, before we do that, I don't mean to. We had a question. Do, do we, are we, can we take them? Or? Um, okay, well, in order to facilitate this conversation, if everybody's willing to stick around for a couple more minutes after nine o'clock, then we'll squeeze in couple of questions and then we'll give the folks a chance to wrap up, okay? Everybody agreeable? How much could have been saved if we didn't do the water um, park thingy in the park? Uh, that's a good question and I will say this is another sticking point in the city, right? There was, there was a major personal donation made for that particular part of the park. It's been done. It was done by the Pomelo family, and they had a family friend who um, had a little daughter that's been in a wheelchair. This was the story that we received Monday night, and uh, her entire life, and was never able to uh, really go out and venture into water parks and into pools. And, and so the donation was made to, to really define that fountain area and turn it into a splash pad. And, and so we were told Monday night at the meeting that that was really non-negotiable, that, that the million dollar gift that we received uh, was kind of you know, dedicated to that particular area. And um, so we were kind of tied to that. And we've had that discussion in the city when we get major don donations like that. But I will say, and I've said it all along, that there are people like the Pomelos and there's people like the Pecors and other families that are very, very generous to this city. Okay, I've done amazing work, okay? And, 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 by, and, and yes, they have the resources to do it, but there's a lot of families that have resources to do it that don't do what these families do. They send 500 kids to summer camps, the Pomelo family. I mean, I, I, we get a lot of heat for taking these gifts, but I will tell you that they are well worth it in the long run for the quality of life for the city of Burlington and for our youth. And so I never shy away from thanking the Pomelos or any other family that steps up and makes a gift like that. To me, it's part of Burlington, and I, I just appreciate the efforts that these families have done. 
for, for the city of Burlington and for the families of Burlington. So I, I know it's hard for some people to understand why that splash pad's there, but there's a reason, and I, and I can argue that reason. Thanks. Commissioner Gulick. Thank you. Um, I'll take it as a good sign that we only had one question tonight regarding the school, so that's good. Thank you. Um, we wanted to say thank you to the voters of Burlington for passing the school budget. That felt great. Um, all, all the wards passed, and it was close to 70%, so thank you so much for that. Um, I also wanted to say that on April 2nd, so that's next Tuesday, we will have our organizational board, so we will be re-voting on a chair and a vice chair. Um, as well as a secretary. And we will also be welcoming Kendra Sowers, who's the new District Ward 4 and 7 uh, commissioner, so that's exciting. Um, and I also just wanted to make a plea. I am on the Early Ed Task Force. We're working on early education in the city of Burlington. And we would like to get as many people as possible to uh, fill out a survey about pre-K early ed in the city. You do not have to have children. You do not have to be a toddler. It is for everybody, <laughs> everyone who lives in Burlington. So if you could go to the bsdvt.org website, you will see it right there on that page. It says Early Ed Task Force Releases Pre-K Survey. If you click on that, it's an online survey. We're just trying to gather as much information as we can um, as we move forward with expanding pre-K in the city of Burlington. So I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, we had a great Beyond Black History <coughs> Month event last Friday at the high school. Um, we had almost 300 people in attendance and we saw performances by choirs from C.P. Smith School and Edmund School. Um, IAA children had the fifth and first grade buddies and the Monday morning drummers performed uh, and as well as J. Kalu performed which is a a city uh, group and same with A2VT which I think stands for Africa to Vermont. Um, there was a lot of tabling by local organizations and then the, they fed us a nice dinner and there were Champlain drummers at that uh, dinner. So it was a nice event. Uh, it was the second annual and I believe it's going to be held again March 2020. So try to put that on your calendar and it kind of moves around but typically we'll have it in March uh, because the superintendent says that black history doesn't end with February <laughs> and he's right. <laughs> Councilor Polino, you got a few minutes. So I just want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, I know I introduced myself. I want to I'm really uh, truly honored to have received everybody's support. I'm here to work with every single person in this room outside this room, supporter, non-supporter and I've tried my best to, to meet people who've reached out to me. Um, I have a couple announcements. I'll be at the Bagel Cafe every second and fourth Saturday from 8 o'clock until 9, unless people show up, then I'll, I'm certainly glad to um, stay past that time. Um, I'm having an event on April 5th, which is a Friday from 5 to 7. It's really just a welcoming event for me. Franklin Paulino, see, there you go. So I'm just looking to uh, introduce myself further, give you a chance. I will provide some food. I haven't decided what I'm going to be able to cook um, for the event, but more of a community event. It'll be here at the Miller Center, 5 to 7. Um, uh, you, I'll send out a Facebook on Franklin Polino for City Council. Um, that's my page. Um, I also plan on being at the Jolly every so often. I hope Councillor Dang and I know uh, Councillor Hartnett and hopefully Mr. Wright will, will join us. And I'm really just looking to bring everybody together and continue this conversation that we're, every, there are a lot of good ideas that I think we can put pencil to paper and, and work together on. So thank you. Thank you. And I believe we had one more question. I'll just leave it as a remark since we are closing up for the night, which is just that you may have known that we did just pass the resolution at the NPA to support $5,000 for the new North End. Uh, and we hope that we'll have the council support for that um, and that we maintain our, um, it's important to me that the NPA, ma NPA maintains its autonomy. And I think that I just want to convey that I think there are a lot of people in this room who are committed to making sure that this NPA has energy and I think that $5,000 um, is a very small ask to be able to do that. So this is our, our resolution, so yeah, two words. 
So um, if you want to comment on it, that's fine, but it's also the end of the meeting, so I just want to throw that out there. I, I do want to comment on that because yep. you're two of the counselors out here, Councillor Jang and myself, are probably the two biggest supporters of the MPA resolution. We're the ones that brought to the regional council, and we'll be glad to su support this, even though I'm not on the council. I'll go and speak at that time. I will take this opportunity just to thank everybody. It's been an incredible eight years for me. I've been so lucky. Um, as, as, I, as I said Monday night, other than being a dad, this has been the best experience of my life. Uh, there is nothing more humbling to, to grow up in this city, attend the public schools, play it all in the soccer and Little League games, right? Go to the high school here, run a business on North Avenue for nearly 20 years, then have your family grow up and your daughter go to the school that you went to and your wife working for the city. It's just, it's just so humbling to serve the city. And then to go back and serve on the council. It's just been an incredible, incredible run. I got some family issues with my mom that we're gonna be dealing with, we're gonna take care of. And if the opportunity ever comes back for me to be able to serve the city, I would want to do it. I'm not burned out, I'm not frustrated. Uh, I do give the administration hell once in a while and I do have that <laughs> representation, but uh, I look forward to being here at all the MPAs as I usually do. I'll be staying on the pack, I'll be working closely with the schools, which are just the best value in, this, in, in the world. The public schools here in Burlington are just unbelievable. So anyways, I want, just want to thank you. You'll see me around and I'll be active and, and I'll always be supporting the MPAs. So thank you, Karina. All right, and with that, I'd like to close our meeting by thanking all of our presenters and the audience. Thank you for all of your participation. This is what makes it work, and we will see you again on the fourth Wednesday of April. Well, thank you very much. Good night.